Good day, everybody. Welcome to the Deal Scout. On today's show, we're going to have a conversation with a man across the pond, Mr. Mark. Mark, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> a man from across the pond. That's a good title. Yeah. I'll have that as my subheading. <laughs> I like it. The man from across the pond, right, si right outside <laughs> of uh, London, right? Is that right? It is. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Offices in London, but um, a lot of what um, I've been doing recently is based from my home office, which I have here. I say home office. It's not quite in the home, but it's, it's very similar. I've got a photographic studio, so very cool. it's and, within the photographic studio. And I'm looking, so people listening and they're, they're, I got to describe it because they're only can listen, but I, I'm looking on the background. I see boss equity. I see a bookshelf with books and some cool logos. So why don't you tell brain. us a, in a brain, <laughs> right? I see an yeah. actual brain. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what is boss equity? So Boss Equity, we are a m and investment company. We, we work with companies within the software sector. So that's been my background. That's the area that we've always focused upon. And I've been in the software sector for nearly 30 years. Um, prior to that, I worked in m and and I suppose it's a case of bringing the two together. The brain is a reference to another company. And if I move to the side here, not that your audio listens will be able to see this, but you can. I've got another logo, which is Outsmart. And that, again, is aimed within the software sector. And it's about strategic positioning and being able to communicate more effectively to your target market, but very strategically. And actually, that came as a spinoff from the work that we did on the Boss Equity side. Okay. So you started in m and got in technology, ran, ran some companies, had some events there, and then you got back into M&A. Like, walk us through, like, why, why the evolution? How did that evolution look like? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> how do I condense all of that? It's, um, yeah, it's a long story, but to try and sort of hit you with that, the headline information. I got into M&A at a very early age. Um, I didn't think so at the time, but I mean, I was just in my mid twenties, mid to late twenties. And I happened to be introduced to a guy called John Oakes based in the UK who had been doing M&A for years and years and years. He asked me to join the company, which I did. And he gave me a good solid grounding, gave me exposure, explained what he had been doing. And he was very, very good at, he had quite a an unusual background in the fact that he was an ex Barnardo's boy. He'd been an orphan, came from the East end of London, had been very, very successful in M&A and became a multimillionaire and was very good at m and I, I became good friends with him. And when the day used to finish in the office, we used to sit chatting for sometimes hours into the evening where he'd be telling me stories about his life, but he'd also be talking to me about the principles in m and and I found that that really interesting. And I worked with him for a time. And then, and then I got into the software sector. Software sector was just really on the rise. There were lots and lots of opportunities there. Worked for a number of different organizations, learned a lot, was a divisional manager in a much larger uh, distribution company here in the UK. Um, I worked for an American organization uh, that was selling document management. I worked for a document management where I became managing director and a shareholder. And I got involved with a German organization that ran into some problems. And they were pan-European. I was part of that pan-European management team. And I helped to spearhead uh, a management buyout when they ran into financial problems. And I did that. And during the process of that, which it took quite some time, uh, about six months to put all of that together, to be able to find investment, put the business plan together and so on. Um, uh, somebody who's now become a very good friend said to me, wow, that's great. You must be feeling really over the moon about doing that. And I admitted to him, I wasn't. I was actually exhausted. And I'd been motivated by... Some of the things that had gone on in this business where we'd been, the management team had been kept in the dark about the true financial standing of the business. And I said to him, I don't know if I really want to continue on this journey. So we'd found the funding. The business was going to be run by the um, management. We'd thrown out the sort of the head office management. Uh, we kept a few of them, a few of the software developers, but the business was going to be rebranded. 
And I said, I don't know if that's the direction I want to go in because it, it meant I had very young children, three very young children at the time. And it would have meant me in some sort of pan-European management role, doing a lot of traveling, be away from home a lot of the time. And to be honest with you, by then, I think um, that the, the business had lost its leading advantage that it had. It was developing some interesting technology, but there were a lot of players by that time who had come into the market. Um, and I was probably just feeling a bit tired and flat. So yeah. I started this conversation and I ended up forming a business, which was Boss Equity with the guy on the telephone. I had a, an hour and a half conversation and I said to him, what about you? And he, he did recruitment specifically within the document management industry. And at that time we called the business document boss. And the idea was that we were going to provide services to the boss within the companies that were in the document management sector. And over the years, we've grown and done deals on four continents. I've been involved in over 120 deals uh, personally. And um, we've sort of morphed in the fact that we don't just focus on document management, content management, um, workflow. We, we now say we focus on the software sector. Um, and we've done deals of all sizes, from really quite small ones to, to really big ones. You know, we're talking over a billion. Nice. All right. Yeah. So I love your, I love the story now. Two things that I want to kind of dig into is you're, you're getting to this place. You see the, the opportunity in front of you and, you know, to run the, the pan European, you know, group. And you looked at your little kids, what was going through your head where you could say, I have to choose this or that, right? Like you, you saying you were feeling flat, you had little kids travel, all that stuff. Like how did, how did you weigh out the decision? to choose what you did? Good question. Um, part of that was experience because previously I'd had a role where I ran a division where I was working in South End in Essex, which is in the east side of uh, England. And I was traveling a hundred miles each day to the office to run this division. And it was a tough job. And then I was finishing the day and I was driving home again. And I did that for quite some time. Um, and it was during that period that my daughter, my first, my oldest daughter was born. And it just made me stop and think about life generally and, and life work balance. And also the other thing was that the change that was happening, there were lots of changes happening. One of which was the internet and communication. And I thought the business world that I was used to a lot of businesses, <clears throat> excuse me, they do, they tend to have clients within a 30 mile radius. Yeah. I'm now in the software sector. We've now just got this thing called the internet. I mean, it had been around for a while before that, but it was really becoming an essential part for all types of businesses. And I thought I could do business with anybody anywhere in the world. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah. Now, the reality of that was that there was still a lot of hangover in people's thinking and perception. It's only just recently, and I think COVID is a big part to that, yeah. that people do not care where you're, where you're actually are. You know, if you can deliver the service, it would be different if I was a painter or a decorator, but I'm not the service that I, I deliver. You know, I could be anywhere in the world. And, and that's what's happened over the years. So I looked at that. I saw that I would be spending a lot of time away from home. By that time I had three children and I wanted to be around to see them grow up. Yeah. So you, you, you make those decisions and that changes the direction of your life. But the other thing was I'd, I'd always wanted to have my own business from a child. You know, when I was eight, I, I went out cleaning cars and doing odd jobs and, thinking about what I was going to do when I was older. I knew I needed to gain experience by working for other businesses, but my aim was always to have my own business. Yeah. That's awesome. man. I, uh, it's, it's a very honorable approach by, while you're looking at kids, my kids, my own life, my own business travel, what's going on in the, you know, in the industry, the internet could, you know, people can, it took a while for people to catch on to this, but like you can have clients that are outside your driving radius now. Right. So that's oh, a, that was a, you know, a major evolution in, in the way we do commerce. 
Uh, let me ask you a personal question. Uh, sure. what, describe to me the perfect uh, fish and chips setup, right? Because we're over here in the U.S. and maybe a few people understand, you know, fish and chips. But you know, <laughs> over in the U.K., <laughs> over there, how do you guys do fish and chips? What's a perfect? You and I go out to get a get a bite to eat. We we just did yeah. a big deal. And we're going to go get some fish and chips. Describe to me what the perfect setup is. Um, probably uh, a fish and chip shop that's by one of the traditional seaside resorts um a really good one where you feel as though the fish has almost come straight out the sea straight in there um i think the old style sort of white tiles busy buzzing sort of place where sometimes they have a bit of a restaurant out the back um so there are a few around that still cook those chips and the fish in a particular type of fat, and I can't remember what it is, yeah. but it's very different to sort of some of the modern oils. There are very few of those around. That's that's quite nice. And fish that when you break it open from the batter, it it, it is just beautifully succulent and white. Yeah. There do they go. still serve it? It's been a while since I've been over there, but do they still serve it on newspaper? No. No. Very okay. rare. I don't. I'm, I don't know any. There may be some out there that still do it, but it tends to be wrapped up in in white paper yeah because yeah. there i think the print from newspaper <laughs> is probably people are very much more health conscious they, you know years ago they didn't care or they didn't know mm. but nowadays it tends to be uh served in white paper Got and it. people uh, still eat it with their fingers though yeah mm, yeah that's so sort good. Of do you like hard. vinegar vinegar on yours yep the malt yeah okay. vinegar and a little bit of salt i tend to keep salt out of my diet most of the time because i'm very health conscious you know i yeah. still keep fit and do a lot of uh training but uh that's the exception. I will put salt on when I'm having fish and chips. All right. Very good. All right. So back, back to business. Sorry, man. All right. So we're, we're here, here we are, we're, we're going back in time. All right. So, uh, Mark, we have an opportunity to go. I think the guy's name who mentored you, Mr. Oaks, right? That's right. Yes. Okay. Yes. So me, you and Mr. Oaks, we just finished a great day, man. We've been working all day and, you know, after business hours, we're going to have that chat that you said sometimes goes for hours. And, and Mr. Oaks is going to sit down and teach you and I a lesson, the principles of M&A, right? What are, what okay. are a few points that he would make for the principles of M&A from Mr. Oaks back in the day? And maybe have a, have a scotch or something like that. You know, uh, I'd be yeah. happy to join you boys for that. But what okay. would Mr. Oaks say? Well, first of all, I would probably have to change the language that he uses because he's, <laughs> he was a real character. And yeah. uh, um, it was colourful language, and and that was just a reflection of of how he was brought up, the area he was brought up in. But I, I never took offence from anything that he said. That wasn't that wasn't why my way of communicating. But we yeah. were just different in that respect. But uh, I think we always got on well. Um, so many things that I learned, um, many things that are contrary to what you will typically hear. The lots I, I, you know, I still continue. I, I took the principles and then I built on top of what he had with my own experiences and knowledge. But I think, um, first of all, looking at businesses and then looking at the business element and being able to put a valuation on that. Most of that is just total bullshit. <laughs> they call it the art of valuation, but you're just saying it's a magic <laughs> show bullshit, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see... I, I've sold all types of businesses. And in those days, it literally was any type of business. It, nowadays, it's software tech. So it doesn't involve things like property. Now, here's a really good example. Property, you can value because there's very likely going to be another very similar property that's probably in the same street that was built at the same time that is exact in every way. And there is a number of examples where it's been sold before. So you can actually create a point system and you can come up with a pretty accurate valuation of that property. And what we used to do years ago, you know, if you were selling, for instance, a, a restaurant or a pub, and they're the sort of things that I first got involved with when I was in my 20s, is you're selling the business, but the property as well. We would go in and value that property. And that, that's possible. But to value, and especially now with something like software tech, and to say somebody it's worth, you know, 73 million nonsense absolute nonsense it's supply and demand and it's it's what somebody's worth somebody's willing to pay for that business you know i've seen i've seen companies and i've had 
experienced buyers say to me, that business is worth X and no one's going to pay more than that. And then I've sold it for six times more than that figure. I've had multiple bids on a company where it's very closely in, in range. And then another bid comes in and it's several times higher. Who's right? It, it really is down to, you see, every business is as unique as a fingerprint. And actually, you have to be able to make an assessment. And the problem is, and, and this is where I might upset some of the people who are going to be listening to your podcast, but well, let's hey, do who it. cares? <laughs> let's yeah, go for it. who cares? <laughs> is my, in my terms, oh, there's, too many, there's too many bean counters involved in M&A. And what I mean by that is that they come from a financial background. They look at things through a spreadsheet and they don't look at the business commercial aspect of it not to a degree that makes any sense. So if, if I'm looking at a business and if I was an acquirer, the real assessment as to value is when I take A and add it to my business, what will it give me? What is that increase that it would give me? And that will, could be totally different to any other business that exists in the world. And then the other thing is, is looking at that business, and this is where something that's called competitive space comes in, is if I'm going to acquire that business and I can see an uplift that it will give to my company and they're giving me uh, a price that they believe it's valued at are there any other businesses that are just like that that are almost identical in that region that will give me the same if there's not then it's very very difficult to assess because as I said it's not like property you know yeah. A five-bedroom house that's on this street and that was sold in the last few months. Yeah, I can have a fair assessment, but it doesn't work like that in M&A. Yeah. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot involved in M&A. It's far more complicated. People want to simplify it, and I understand. There are times when you need to be able to value a business. So if you've got shareholders, say, for instance, one of the a shareholder dies and he's passing on his shares or the shares want to be sold, you have to come up with a figure and you have to have a methodology. So I'm not saying that there isn't a reason to have methodology at a certain time, but when it comes to saying this business will sell for X, it's nonsense. And these companies that, that create price lists and they break it down by sector and they create EBITDA multiples. I mean, that is just nonsense. It really is. All they're doing is they're, they're averaging. And it's like averaging the height of every human being that's alive today and saying, because there are babies increase included in that average, that the next person through my door is going to be four foot six. It's, it's useless, isn't it? It really is useless. And, you know, that's about the value that it brings from that perspective. But as I said... There are times when you may have partners, they're wanting to shift shares and you have to come up with some means of valuing. And that's where you need that sort of approach. But otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So me, you and Mr. Oaks are sitting at a, at a coffee shop or a, or a pub or something, you know, like we mm. and, uh, and a company comes by, they're in document management or content management software company. Yep. They're kind of right up your alley and they go, okay. hey, give me an idea for what this is worth, right? What questions are you going to ask them to kind of get an idea in your head what this thing may sell for? Because it might sell for seven more times than that. But what questions are you going to ask those people? You and Mr. Well, Oaks. <laughs> If they're coming to me to do business with me, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to get a feel for them. Mm -hmm. I don't do business with people I don't think I'll get on with or I don't like. I've learned that over the years. Yeah. I don't have to anymore, so I'm not going to do that. But once they pass the, the, the sort of the mark, do I like them test? And it's got to be the same for them as well. You yeah. know, I will be me. And if they don't like that, it's better we find out early. The second thing is... <laughs> Value is built up in layers. And one of the things that we do, and we go through a, a process here, now this is, this is much more regimented. We have a documented process and we do a workshop, is I'm looking for the diamonds within the business. Mm -hmm. And that's quite difficult because I would say a lot of the time, the owners don't know it themselves. They don't see what that value is. And the value could be different to different sectors of the market. 
So I'm looking for the diamonds within their business that can be grabbed, polished and brought to the surface. And then the art is about what I call competitive space, which is being able to communicate to those potential buyers why they should be of interest, why this company should be of interest without overloading them. So, so one thing that I never do, and again, probably a lot of people will be scoffing at this, is I don't create a big, thick information memorandum and throw that to buyers. Because again, I think that is just crazy way of, of working. Um, we create a summary information. I pull out the relevant points for that particular buyer. I give them an overview, but I don't throw, I've seen information memorandums, 300, 400 pages. Nobody's gonna read that. <laughs> no, exactly. A, nobody's gonna read it. And B, it doesn't help anybody. Yeah. And I wouldn't like, three or 400 pages of my client's business being thrown out into the marketplace, regardless of whether it's under NDA or not. It, it, I liken it. So this is how I would liken it. You imagine we're going, you've decided you want to go and buy a car. You're bringing me along because I know a bit about cars. And we walk into a car showroom. You say you, you we walk into say BMW. They've got a number of different sports cars. So they say, what is it you're after? You say you're after a sports car. He says, hang on a minute. And he walks out the back and he goes and gets the manuals for all of those sports cars that they've got. He gives you a big pile and he says, go home, read through all those manuals and then come back to me when you've made up your mind. That's not selling. <laughs> and that's what I'm here to do is to sell the business. What he should be doing is asking you what's important to you. Have you got a family? How many seats do you need? Is economy important? all of those things, and then make a recommendation and point you towards the right car. Um, but that's not done a lot in the M&A industry. And a lot of the reason for that is it's very difficult, I think, for a lot of people who are involved in, say, call it brokerage of deals. If you don't come from the industry, if you don't have a background so that you can talk, for instance, in my case, about software, you're going to avoid it. And that's why particular approaches have been adopted over the years and it then becomes a bit of an echo chamber that becomes the accepted process and others just follow and they do exactly the same thing doesn't mean we don't answer questions of the buyer of course we do it doesn't mean we don't get into detail of course we do we'll probably get into more detail i know my clients businesses far more than the m a the average m a broker but i don't just dump it all on you you know yeah. It's a bit like when you said to me, tell me a bit about your life. It's like me saying, well, I was born at this day and then just <laughs> tell you everything that happened to me right the way yeah. through to now. You, you would soon lose interest. I can, I can tell you. Yeah. Well, you know, two people fell in love and they, you know, they met here and then here comes. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Let's not start when I was born. Let's go back to when my <laughs> parents were born because they will give you the full background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, we just, you and I just did a big M&A deal. You, you said, what, what, what's one of the larger deals that you've worked on? You don't have to get a company name, but like size-wise. Um, 450 billion. Okay. So 450 billion, that's with a B, right? So you and I, we, we uh, have a good event, right? So we, yep. we helped sell this company. We had, a, we had a blast doing it, right? Made some good friends. And then you and I are going to go pick out a car together. What, what, talk, talk to me about what kind of car we're going to go for. You said you're a car guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> in the analogy no i am actually I, okay. I i do quite like cars um i quite like jaguars i've had a few jaguars over the years um i had a jaguar xkr 2s sorry xkr s which was the sports version i don't know if you ever know it there weren't very many made um but that was a fantastic that was a five liter 570 brake horsepower car but it just sounded fantastic um, I've had the XF prior to that, which is a very, very good car. Won lots of awards. Very, very solid car. I've had a Jaguar F-Type. Um, I had that last year, actually. Yeah. And I'm looking potentially at buying an F-Type SVR, which is an F-Type that they've sort of tuned up a bit. And it's SVR, I think Special Vehicle, something or other. So, we're so gonna go I've had a, I've had a Tesla, yeah, I've had a Tesla Model X, 
I've had a Toyota Supra many years ago, which I enjoyed. I've had BMW 7 Series, BMW 5 Series. I've had lots. I've got, at the moment, because I'm not doing much driving, I've got an Audi TT, which actually really surprised me. Yeah. I bought that from my neighbor because he, he bought himself a Ferrari and he had this car. And I, I was selling my Tesla and I thought I need something to get me to the gym. So I bought this and I was really surprised. Really nice car. Okay, but but yeah. you you and I going out, we're gonna go pick up a, the Jaguar, right? Maybe a Jaguar okay. or um, any car, a Mes- any car. A Mercedes, a yeah, Mercedes S sixty five. All right, you'd really need to be a car buff to know about what that looks like. <laughs> that's a that's a nice car. Yeah, All right. maybe try that. So we 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 jump in the car and we're we're going to a a football game, soccer game, right? Who are we yep. gonna go watch? Who's your team? Ooh. Well, I used to be a youth football coach, so I used to be fairly agnostic because the lads within the those two teams that I coach, they all had different teams. So I used to say I support England. So it would be to go and see England at Wembley against Germany or Brazil. There you go. That, that be would fun. be a good game. Yeah. Right, and in yeah. fact, to see them in the World Cup final next year, that would be nice. I think they've got a chance. All right. Now, what kind of guys or, or gals like you, you said, you know, when you're in a coffee shop or you and I are in a pub and someone comes up, brings a perfect deal to us, right? Software company, really great thing. There's not many competitors in the space. So perfect deal comes across, but you don't like the person. You said, if I don't get off with someone, like if, if, if I can't get along with someone, I just don't do business with them. What are some characteristics that you look for in a person before you do a deal with them? Or what are some deal killers in a person? Ego. Ego, I think, gets in the way of more business than anything else. Um, I'm looking, I'm looking for somebody that um, I just think I can get on with. They're going to be fairly straight talkers, don't mind that, but respectful. I think that's it's important to have respect, but to have good communication skills. Um, they're going to have their areas of expertise that are far greater than mine in certain areas, and I'm going to have mine. And what you have to do is you have to come together to form a team. And it really is a team effort. They will know form far more about their business and the technology that they sell than I do. I've got to learn quite a lot quite quickly. Um, I think I'm also looking for flexibility of mind because I approach, I approach the sale of a business or the acquisition of a business differently. You can't go out and... Um, Somebody was, uh, somebody was asking me a similar question. <laughs> there is, I found out just recently, a book, M&A for Dummies. <laughs> I mean, you can't go out and the way that deals are really constructed and, and, and when you, if you want to be really successful, one of the things that I pride myself on is that once I get a deal to the area of an offer, I complete every single one. And I've been, you know, I've done over, well over 120 deals now. I've, I've lost count recently. I haven't kept a tally. Um, but there is an art to that. And a deal that goes through a process and doesn't complete is really painful and really costly in more ways than one. And you don't tend to hear about those. So I'm looking for somebody that has got a certain flexibility of mind that doesn't come to me with a lot of myths and misconceptions. They may do that, but they will allow me to talk to them about a different way of doing things. And they've got that flexibility of mind that they can go, okay, that makes sense. I'm not, I'm not saying that they necessarily want, I don't want people to be always agreeing with me. Don't need that. But they can sit down and they can listen to the logic and they can look, listen to the evidence that I've got and they can go, okay, that makes sense. Let's do that. Some people just want to hang on to their their beliefs and not change they just haven't got that flexibility of mind i think that's that wrapped up in fear a little bit yeah so i'm looking for all of those things and also just i I want a client that i can enjoy the process with and they can enjoy working with me if they can't forget it just it's not worth it oh it isn't absolutely yeah sometimes that's one of the reasons i started doing a podcast yeah tell us about your podcast yeah so my podcast is, believe it or not, is called Boss It. So the reason for Boss It was because Boss Equity, but also a lot of people within the industry tended to call us the Boss Guys, or they'd find up and go, "Hi, hey, hey, Boss." Or, and the other thing was to, to boss something. 
is sort of modern vernacular to be able to conquer it, to be able to perform it at a masterful level. So I thought that would be really quite nice. And I took it as a personal project to, um, to talk to people within the industry, have fun doing it, not to have a highly structured podcast, a bit like this one. You didn't send me a list of questions and say, I'm going to ask you all of these questions. We just had a quick chat beforehand and then we just went for it, which is what I like. So we always, we always sort of positioned it as, a, as an over-the-shoulder over listen to two guys in the industry having a conversation and informally and going where the conversation takes them. And that's what it was all about. And I just, it was a personal project for me. And I thought, I'll, I'll enjoy that and I'll see how things go. I didn't really have any particular objective with it. I thought there was potential in this thing called podcasting. I've done about, I don't know, about 90 episodes maybe now. And we're just about to enter season three. Uh, and I've not pushed the podcast at all because I wanted to create that backlog of library. Now, you've done more, many more podcasts than me. You've done an awful lot. Um, but I wanted to get that, that library of podcasts up to a certain stage so that when somebody does find it and they come there, there's going to be something of interest. And that's whereabouts we are now. We're just sort of entering that stage where we're going to start being proactive and getting it out there. There's some, you know, I've really enjoyed it. I've, I've had some really funny conversations. I've had some <laughs> deep conversations. I've had some emotional conversations. I've had all sorts. I've had some conversations that never get published. For various reasons. Oh, all right. So you don't have to say, so I'm going to ask you that question. What would make you record, you know, spend an hour with a guy, a gal or whatever, and you're recording an episode and you go, I can't publish this. What would, you know, minus technical difficulties, what would prevent you from publishing something? Well, there's been, there has been a couple of technical difficulties, a couple of times. Yeah. One podcast, which was a real shame I did with a lady. And for some reason, it just disappeared into the ether. It was, it was using Zoom recording. When I came to, to get to it, it had just gone. Don't know what happened there. So the reason that I don't publish it is um, people coming to me, and the only reason they're coming to me is they want to flog their book, flog their training course, yeah. sell me something, and they've got almost written down, mention this, say this, say that, say that, and it's, it's a bit like talking to a robot. <laughs> and I get to the end of it and I think, oh, you know, it wasn't, that wasn't a conversation. He's, they're just looking for the opportunity to jump to the next point. By the way, I've just published a book, ISBN number. I just have to have it written down, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, it, it's too phony. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned about Boss Hit, but hopefully, you know, it's part of the natural conversation that we I, have. I asked you. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other ones, there occasionally where perhaps the dynamics of me and this other person don't work and I'm wanting them to relax and I'm wanting me to be relaxed during the podcast. I'm wanting it to be natural and authentic. And for one reason, the dynamics don't work. And I go, that was deadly dull. That was <laughs> yeah. really dull. Nobody you know? wants to listen to that. Right? <laughs> no one's going no to listen to it. I mean, unless you want to send it to sleep. Although I did, <laughs> I did have a client once and he'd sent out some of my podcasts to the team because we were meeting this management team beforehand. And in the interval, because we started doing this workshop with them, in the interval, one of the technical guys came up to me and he said, oh, he said, it's been, since it's been introduced to me, I've been listening to your podcast last thing at night, he said, really helps me get off to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, he did say, he just, he said, it's your voice. He said, your voice helps. He said, yeah. it just, <laughs> he wasn't really just that it was totally boring, but uh, it did make me laugh at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. So uh, what's your favorite question to ask someone, right? All right. So it's a business podcast and you got, you know, bossing things and conquering things and this and that. What, what's, a, what's your favorite question to ask someone if, if it's recording or not, or if you're over a uh, cocktail or not, but it's just like, what's your favorite question to ask someone? I suppose if it was in a podcast, well, there's a number of different questions and I don't, I don't tend to have too much set questions. Um, I found some of the i'm thinking one in particular but i won't go into too much detail because that is live um and i gain feedback i had one podcast where it started off and i thought i'm gonna hate this because this guy was just going at 100 miles an hour and i felt as though he was shouting at me and he was <laughs> it was a 
it was like as though he's done it a hundred times before. You know, I, if I walked away, he'd still be going and I could come back after five minutes. But then I started asking him some questions and he opened up a bit about a particular area of his life. And then the real him came out and that really was quite a moment. Um, and occasionally that happens. You get that moment where somebody opens up and they say something you don't expect. Mm -hmm. And then you follow up on that question. So I suppose my question, my, my favorite question, but it's not a question specific is a technique is to ask a question that goes deeper. One of the things I don't like is, and I see this on TV, the, the person being interviewed or the interviewee has got a series of questions and they ask a question, they get an answer, then they just ask the next question. And it doesn't matter what they say, you know, they could say, and then I was on the edge of the cliff and yeah, anyway, next question. And they just, <laughs> they're not really listening. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I think you have to listen to the other person and it has to be a conversation. And, and that's always irritating. So I think the follow-up question to go deeper is, is really intriguing. Um, but from a business perspective, I think the question I, I often will move towards, and if it's relevant, is say, from all of your experience, what would be the one thing that you would tell somebody who was coming to do your job? What's the biggest lesson that you've learned? And I like that because it makes people really think like some of the questions that you've asked me today, you, you know how to ask a question because you give me some time for to process. And you can see when somebody's processing because their eyes go up and they look around, but that's good because you're stimulating their thinking. So I suppose, I, let me ask you that question then. So you've learned a lot yeah, <clears throat> and you have many experiences. And I think that's one of the benefits of getting older. What's the biggest lesson that you've ever learned? Ah, that's a great question. All right. My eyes are all bouncing all over the place, right? I'm, I'm searching, I'm searching, you know, the archives in the brain going, what's the biggest yeah. lesson? Give me a second to think about that. What's the yeah. biggest lesson I've, I, uh, all right. What comes to mind often quickly is, is yeah. often the right answer. So, There's no right and wrong answer. Yeah. So I think the, the biggest lesson is who am I, right? So, this is kind of like the, the depth of this, the, the, this conversation is, is what's yeah. the biggest lesson I learned is who am I, right? So if I, if I am operating in who I feel God made me to be, yeah. then everything I do will be aligned with my morals, my values, my ethics. It'll be aligned whether, it's, whether I win or lose, I will be the fullest version of myself. So I think that the, the best thing I've learned was to dig into who I am and just spend a lot of time trying to figure out who is God and who did he make me to be? Because at the end of the day, then I'm in peace with everything I do, whether I win or fail, made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, doesn't matter because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So I think that would be the, the biggest thing I've learned and am learning is that identity piece. That, that was brutal. I, I almost killed myself because I, I couldn't figure it out. Right. Like, so like that, that's, wow. that's a good thing to dig into that. That's what I've learned or learning. Wow. You dropped, you dropped a point there, didn't you? When you just said, I almost killed myself. Yeah. How did you almost kill yourself? Uh, so I cashed out my government pension to, to build a fitness technology company. I went all in and, uh, and it just failed miserably. I just had my first daughter, right? So I have a kid now and yep. I can't make money. I lost all my money and like, I can't sleep. I'm stressed out of my brains, so, you know, like here I am an educated guy. I've built, you know, built some cool things in the past. And I just couldn't make anything work. And I felt yeah. miserable. I felt worthless, bro. And uh, yeah. I, because I wasn't sleeping, I would, you know, wake up or well, not even wake up. I would just be up at three in the morning and I would just yeah. go for, you know, 10 mile hikes, you know, just walking around town trying to figure out who, you know, who I am. I just remember yeah. standing on the bridge, just thinking of swan diving, knowing what it would look like. Cause I, you know, I spent some time in the military or not military, uh, fire service. Um, right. So like, I was just, Services, yeah. yeah. So I saw that I've, I've, I think that was the, the turning point. I was standing there and I was thinking of swan diving and I just felt like God say, who are you? And I go, I don't know. And he goes, figure that out. So that, I think that's been a, a it's been. So how years. has that, how has that changed you? How are you different now to that? to the person that you were before? 
man, I tied my identity. You know, we're deal makers. You and I, we love business because it's who we are, right? Yeah. We love people. We love business. We love this because it's, it, it, it's, it's operating in who we are. So yeah. I think once I learned that uh, this is just a part of who I am, it's not the results. It's I'm just going to keep doing what, you know, I'm called to do, keep doing. So I think what changed is I stopped trying to chase the results and I just did what I was, what I'm supposed to do, connect with people, mm -hmm. lift people up, put deals together, get out of the way. Right. I'm not a mm -hmm. manager. Right. And because of that, I have so much joy in my life and, you know, whether there's money coming in or not. Uh, and you know, money's coming in and you know, I'm, we're thankful for that. So I think that that changed because in the past I was chasing dollars. I'll do anything. Give me a yeah. phone book. I'll call everybody in that phone book. Give me, you know, give me a, a, a fire hose. I'll run into the fire. Give me, you know, I'll, I'll wrestle alligators. I'll deliver babies. I'll do whatever for, for the, the yes. dollar. But now it's like, no, Josh is, this is who Josh is. Yeah. You've learned about yourself through that process, which is, is, is so valuable. Um, and I think that doing that, I mean, if you'd come to me and you'd spoken about your failures, I'd actually be thinking, this is great mm -hmm. because you will learn more in those failures than when everything goes right. Yeah. Because you keep trying, you have to keep trying different things and it doesn't work and it doesn't work, but you're learning all the time. And I think that's really important. But the key thing there is you have to learn to forgive yourself when you have failures Successful people don't, I mean, that there are going to be some people that perhaps they're born into money and I wasn't, and I, I wasn't handed anything, but you've got to be able to take a risk and say, that might not work out. Not everything will. I mean, that's just the way things are. And when it doesn't work out, you're going to learn a lot, but then go, okay, well, I did it for the best intentions. I went about it in the right way. Move on. Forgive myself for that didn't work out to the degree that I wanted. And it sounds like that that's what you've done. You certainly look happy now. Oh, man, I'm, I'm thrilled. I get to talk with people uh, from all across the world. I get to put deals together. Yeah. I get to lift up people. I get to be a part of investing in people's dreams and such like that. Like, yes. Uh, what else would I rather do? I like what, I like what you're doing. I must admit, I, I've been approached by lots of people that do podcasts and things. But it's quite unique what you're doing. And immediately you explained it to me. I started thinking, oh, that could be of interest. And I started to see possibilities. So it's, yeah, it's really nice. I like it. So we should do a deal together. What we'll do is, you know, we'll, we'll figure out ways to work together. But, you know, what, what I love about this show is what people, you know, you described it perfectly is these conversations, people get to kind of look over the shoulder and they get to know you and I better uh, through our conversation. And then you go, wow, I really like what Mark's doing over there with, with boss and with his group. And maybe I'll buy a business with him. Maybe I'll sell my business. Yeah. Maybe I'll be on his sure. podcast show, but it's just like people could get a peer to who Mark is, you know, and, and what makes yes. him tick, what kind of cars he likes, what kind of food he likes. Yes. You know? yes. So that's, that's why I love this, man. It, it is. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I did the podcast actually yeah. was also, I thought if somebody's thinking about coming to do some business with me, it's, easy, it's better that they find out who is Mark Edwards in a podcast and get a feel for it and go, yeah, I like the guy. Oh, no, I just couldn't work for him, you know, work with him because yeah. it just drives me crazy. But that's good, too. You know, either way, you find out you couldn't or you find out you could. You get a feel for it. Uh, and and that's, that's another reason for doing it. Yeah. Now, we're running out of time. Do I have uh, I'm going to respect your calendar. Do I have time for two more questions for you? Sure, go for it. It's coming right. towards the end of the day for me, so you you are last. I'm going to go and Save the chill out, last, and then I'm right? going to I'm going to rehearse my lines because I've got rehearsals tonight. So um, I've got no no next meeting for a while anyway. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Rehearse your lines for what? <laughs> I, I was just looking at it actually. I mean, I I do uh, amateur dramatics, so I'm in this play called Present Laughter by Noel Coward. So I, it's a local drama group. I went to see a few years ago and I love what they did. I was so impressed. They put on a performance of Lady Killers, which is also in a film that I know from the probably early 60s. And I was so impressed by what they did. I thought, I'm going to go involved with that. Uh, so I've been involved in a few plays. So I have to learn my lines, you see. All right, give, a, <laughs> give us one of your lines here. I'm putting you on the spot. Okay. Um, uh I didn't think you was up. God, you are a dark horse and no mistake because I'm playing the part of a cockney. Yeah. That's that. 
<laughs> I like it. All right. Good. You, got the, you got the part. <laughs> All right. Two more questions. I've never had, I've never had that question asked today. Very good. <laughs> Excellent, Josh. <laughs> yeah. Two more questions. Uh, right. the, the, here's the easy one. Where could people go to learn more about you, to, to follow your podcast, or to connect with you and do a deal with you? Um, find me on LinkedIn, Mark Edwards Boss Equity. Um, you could send me an email. Uh, my email address is mEdwards at bossequity.com. Or you can do a search on iTunes and a whole host of other platforms for podcasts that I can never remember. And do a search for the Bossit, B O S hyphen I T, Bossit podcast. Have a listen to that. I'll tell you what I would appreciate is um, getting feedback from people. Love it, hate it. Perhaps there's topics you'd like me to talk about. Uh, even give me feedback on me as a guest on your podcast. You know, I don't mind either way. If you love it or hate it, it's always good to get f- feedback. Yeah. Last question. You and I are hanging out. Uh, we just hung out with, you know, Mr. Oaks. We, we had some fish and chips. Uh, we <laughs> watched uh, a, a United States play Germany or not United States, UK play <laughs> Germany, right? You <laughs> <laughs> and uh and you're like, Hey man, Josh, before you go, you just, you know, we're driving around in your new Jag and you're like, Josh, before you go, I got to give you this book. You take one book off your bookshelf and hand it over to me. What would that one book be? Slowing down to the pace of life. And I must admit, I've forgotten the name of the author. It may come to me, but if you look it up, you'll find it quite quickly. And I think that that's, one of the most um, insightful and powerful books that I've written. I've read, written, <laughs> read. I haven't written it. <laughs> yeah, it's my own book and I didn't know the author. Yeah. Um, no, Slowing Down to the Pace of Life. Um, the author is now dead. I know that he died uh, a while ago, but I like the title. It, I think it's based in a lot of Buddhist, um, Buddhist philosophy, mm-hmm. but I think a lot of the principles... Um, I really use that on a day-to-day basis. So, yeah, I think that that can help anybody, whatever you do. So go and, go and read that one. That would be Carlson, Richard Carlson. There you go. I knew it would come to me. Perfect. Have perfect. faith. Slowing down. Well, cool, man. So, Mark, thanks for being on the show. Really enjoyed your story. Really enjoyed our time together. Oh, I enjoyed uh, being, being on the show. It was really good. You're great questions, Josh, and I, I like the vibe of it. So um, I hope this becomes a useful podcast and you get lots and lots of listeners. If not, we could, you and I could put people to sleep together like that one IT guy, right? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yes, that's right. (laughs) We call it the the sleeping pill podcast. (laughs) That's right. So ladies and gentlemen, listening into the audience, if you want to learn more about deals and the deal makers, the, the people behind the deals, or maybe you're working on a deal, you could head on over to the dealscout.com, fill out a quick form, maybe get you on the show. Or if you need some help falling asleep, you can listen to us on the dealscout.com and uh, we'll talk to you guys on the next episode. See everybody. Hold on one second, Mark. Let's you and I catch up.